Well, it's Christmas time again, and you know what that means, don't you? Office parties followed by eggnog hangovers and regrets about office parties? Yep. But also, it's time for the traditional Cinefix Yuletide celebration of the best Christmas movie ever made. Die Hard. yippee mother Casey, did you know it was based on a book? Well, yeah, I mean, everybody knows it was a book. It was at the top of every 10 movies you won't believe were based on books list. Not to mention our very own Things You Didn't Know episode. That's right, smartass, you passed the test. So without further ado, and no restraint on spoilers, it's time to ask, what's the difference? I mean, it's right there in the opening credits. Why is it such a surprise? No, I know, dude. I just didn't like the tone. All right, I'm sorry. Look, it's Christmas and I love you. Can we just talk about Die Hard? I'm ho-ho hoping to. Nice. So as everybody knows, Die Hard was based on the 1979 novel Nothing Lasts Forever by Roderick Thorpe. It's a sequel to 1966's The Detective that was itself turned into a movie starring Frank Sinatra. And I only mention that because Thorpe specifically wrote Nothing Lasts Forever so it could be turned into another movie with Frank Sinatra. So with that in mind, it makes sense that the novel is filled with some of the most iconic action set pieces in Die Hard. It's true, the book reads like an action movie, so the biggest differences between the book and movie come with the characters. In the movie, Bruce Willis's John McClane is a blue-collar New York detective, an 11-year veteran of the police force chock full of attitude and problems with authority. Mayday, mayday, anyone copying Channel 9? This channel is reserved for emergency calls only. The f Lady, do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? We meet him on a plane heading out to Los Angeles to visit his estranged wife, Holly, who's now going by her maiden name, Gennaro, at the Nakatomi Corporation's Christmas party. The book follows Joe Leland, an older, retired detective whose attitude comes from baggage of his extra years. He has the events of the previous book in which he gained notoriety for making a high-profile arrest that turned out to be the wrong man, as well as his experience as a fighter pilot in World War II weighing on him. Leland is on his way to LA to meet his daughter, Stephanie, whose married name is Gennaro at the Klaxon Oil Company on Christmas Eve, where they're throwing a party to celebrate the closing of a 150 $50 million deal that would build a bridge in Chile. In both the book and movie, our hero cruises into the party and sizes up the place like a grizzled detective should, including taking an immediate dislike to the coke snorting, watch boasting Ellis. Miss something. However, the movie features Joe Takagi as Holly's boss and head of the Nakatomi Corporation, towards whom McLean seems to be pretty ambivalent. The book instead features a Texan named Rivers as Stephanie's boss, and while he doesn't hate him as immediately as he hates the younger, more coked up Ellis, Leland still thinks Rivers is an asshole. He's worried that his daughter has fallen in with a coke head and a white collar swindler, and disappointed when he reckons that she might have become just as bad herself. In fact, the fancy new watch being shown off in the book was purchased by Stephanie herself, not a gift from Ellis. And this is where the action of the movie starts to get very similar to the book. Once McLean is separated from the party, making fists with his toes, which is actually straight from the book as well, McLean is on the phone when the lines are cut, and as soon as he hears the terrorist gunfire, is able to sneak away with only a tank top and a service pistol among his assets. But meanwhile, we get to meet Hans Gruber, the ruthless but impeccably dressed and classically educated bad guy. Due to the Nakatomi Corporation's legacy of greed around the globe, they're about to be taught a lesson in the real use of power. His novel counterpart is Anton Little Tony Gruber, a similarly urbane villain. But while Hans Gruber's posturing is in the movie revealed to be a front for the heist of millions in negotiable bearer bonds, Little Tony is a more dedicated terrorist, attacking the Klaxon Oil Company for its part in supporting the military junta in Chile with the very big ticket bridge project the company is celebrating that night. You won't hurt me. Oh yeah? Why not? Because you're a policeman. There are rules for policemen. Yeah, that's what my captain keeps telling me. And once the shooting starts, the book and movie are more or less the same. Some of Die Hard's most iconic images are lifted from the book verbatim. For example, the first terrorist killed suffers a broken neck and the indignity of being sent down in an elevator car with a note reading, Now I have a machine gun. The book actually reads, Now we have a machine gun, a ploy by Leland meant to confuse Gruber and his men. Nor does Leland include the festive f you of McLean's ho ho ho, but eh, you get the idea. And in both instances, the poor guy was Carl's brother. From there, McLean and Leland both use the strap of a machine gun to lower themselves from an elevator shaft into an air conditioning vent. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. Throw a body off the building to get the attention of the police, strap a bunch of C4 to a chair in order to blow up half the building while Gruber's men fend off the LAPD's first offensive, and even yells Geronimo, motherfucker" in both mediums. 
Both McLean and Leland communicate and bond with Sergeant Al Powell, who in the book is a much younger man than is portrayed in the movie. And they both deal with the very douchey Dwayne T. Robinson. You listen to me, you little asshole. I'm a asshole. I'm not the one who just got butt f on national TV, Dwayne. <laughs> Leland and McLean both sit and listen to Gruber murder Ellis when Gruber attempts to get his detonators back. Even strapping on a fire hose and jumping off the roof while it explodes behind him happens in both the book and movie. The biggest difference through this middle section of the story is that the novel is told completely from Joe Leland's perspective. In movie terms, it'd be like removing any scene in Die Hard that didn't have John McClane in it. So the book gives us fewer of the mechanics of Gruber's plot, fewer of the boneheaded gaffes of Deputy Chief Robinson, none of the FBI agents Johnson & Johnson, no relation, and zero of television reporter and noted mega son of a bitch Richard Thornburg. All right, no, look, 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 you let me in right now or I call the INS. Comprende? The novel does touch on the hype surrounding the hostage situation, though. Leland via CB is able to speak to more than just Sergeant Al Powell, and in fact his transmissions are being broadcast on network TV. Crowds begin to form outside the Klaxon building, all rooting for Leland to make it through. Yeah, you go, Leland. You, you beat those terrorists. You're my hero. Mr. McLean, Americans all alike. Well, this time John Wayne does not walk off into the sunset with Grace Kelly. Scary Cooper, asshole. But then we arrive at the ending. In the movie, McLean confronts Hans and the one remaining terrorist, and with his pistol taped to his back, takes them both out with some real slick shooting. But as Gruber falls out the window, he grabs Holly's fancy Ellis watch and almost takes McLean's wife with him. The book finds Leland in a similar situation, a pistol taped high on his back and faced with Gruber using his daughter as a human shield. However, in the resulting shootout, Gruber is able to shoot Stephanie once in the gut as Leland puts round after round into him. Then as he falls out the window, Gruber grabs Stephanie's fancy watch. You know, the one she bought for herself to celebrate the bridge deal that prompted Gruber's attack in the first place? And tumbles out the window, Stephanie in tow before Leland can even react. From there, Leland tracks down the remaining terrorist and murders her, defenseless and in cold blood. Just shoots her square in the forehead. Then he finds a stash of corporate documents detailing the bridge project in Chile and the accompanying arms deal that Klaxon and even Stephanie herself was involved in. But that's where the little difference of who bought the watch is actually kind of brilliant. The book makes no bones about Stephanie's culpability in the events at the Klaxon building. She was part of the shadiness that Gruber specifically wanted to attack, and the gift she'd bought for herself to celebrate it became the very thing that killed her. In the movie, as opposed to being a symbol of her complicity in the attack, Holly's watch was instead a gift from Ellis, a guy who's such an ass, even from beyond the grave, he manages to almost get her killed. Hey, babe, I negotiate million dollar deals for breakfast. I think I can handle this Euro trash. Hey, frickin' you talk? Huh? While the movie still uses the watch to illustrate the environment in which McLean finds Holly embroiled, it's just a well executed plant and payoff. And that's it. That's the end of the book, the end of the movie, all the terrorists are dead. Nothing to see here, so we might as well go back and- Oh my god, it's Carl! He's not dead! Look out! That's right, in both the book and the movie, Carl comes out of nowhere at the end, only to be gunned down by Sergeant Al Powell. In the book, however, Carl manages to shoot, like, a bunch of people first. He sprays machine gun fire across a group of reporters mobbing Leland on his way out of the building. Leland himself is hit in the leg, but would have been killed were it not for the heroics of, wait for it, Captain Dwayne T. Robinson. The police captain, who up till now had been a real dick, jumps in front of Leland, getting himself mortally wounded in the process. So instead of reuniting with his lover as snow falls and jaunty Christmas music swells and Argyle driving them to the hospital, I hope, Leland lays bleeding on the street, numb to the fact that his daughter had just been killed right in front of him, and bitter at the sacrifice made to save his life. Oh man. Yeah. Kind of a bah humbug ending. I mean, we can't end the show like this. It's too much of a downer. Well, that's how the book ends. I mean, what do you want me to do? I mean, you sure there aren't any other differences? Uh, just a few small ones, like, uh, well, there's no Argyle in the book. Oh, Argyle, he was the best. Let's end it with Argyle. This is their idea of Christmas. I gotta be here for New Year's. <laughs> yep, that's much better. Merry Christmas, Casey. Merry Christmas to all, Clint. And to all, a good night. With no restraint on spoilers. That's it for this episode of What's the Difference? Let us know how your annual Yuletide screening of Die Hard goes, and be sure to click like and subscribe for more right here on Cinefix.